Hey everyone, Dr. Michael Carey here, and today we're going to continue talking about the fifth trumpet judgment from Revelation 9 and take a deeper look at the demonic creatures that ascend from the bottomless pit when it's opened. Now, if you missed the last video, be sure to go back and watch it, and while you're at it, make sure to hit the subscribe button and click the notification bell so that you don't miss a single video post. Also, we are a listener-supported ministry, and you can find out more about helping us continue to share this content all over the world by visiting us at the website on the bottom of your screen. We truly value your prayers, and every donation, regardless of whether it's large or small, really makes a difference, and it helps the ministry. Well, let's jump right into our conversation for today. We're talking about the fifth trumpet judgment, and in our last session, we talked about the bottomless pit, what it is, and where it came from. Now, Revelation 9, verse 1 and 2 says this, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit, and he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace, so the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke from the pit. And we said that the bottomless pit is a very real place that's somehow connected to the deepest parts of hell, meaning that it's not symbolic or figurative. And we're talking about a very real doorway that's opened with a very real spiritual key. And the fact that all of these things come from the spirit realm doesn't make them any less real. And the truth is, at this point in Revelation, the veil that separates the natural from the supernatural seems to be far thinner than it is right now. We also said that the bottomless pit is such a horrible place that if you remember back in the Gospel of Luke chapter 8, when Jesus cast the demons who called themselves legion out of the man from the region of the Gadarenes, they actually begged Jesus not to cast them into the abyss or the bottomless pit. My point being that the bottomless pit must be a terrible place if demons are afraid of it. Now, I think that the best way to discuss our text for today is to simply walk through it verse by verse. In fact, let's just jump right in and go to Revelation uh, 9, verse 3. It says this, Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. So when the bottomless pit is open, smoke begins to rise out of it, uh, and a horde of demonic creatures ascend from this smoking or smoldering doorway, and they're so numerous in their arrival that they're initially described by the Apostle John as locust. And this prophetic scene is particularly disturbing because these creatures are coming directly from the deepest part of hell where they've been imprisoned for thousands and thousands of years. We're talking about an apocalyptic nightmare. I mean, can you imagine the terror that's going to come on people in a world where hundreds of millions of people who were left behind after the rapture of the church have already died from famine, from war, from disease, and a chain of supernatural events, and now this horde of demon locusts begin to crawl out of hell and attack people on this earth. This is going to be incredibly terrifying. Now, Revelation 9.4 continues to describe this demonic horde, and it says this, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God on their foreheads. Now, for context, I think it's important to remember that as this fifth trumpet judgment is happening, there's also an incredible revival taking place on a global scale through the ministry of the 144,000 witnesses in fulfillment of Joel's prophecy in Joel 2, beginning in verse, two, beginning in verse 28, where it says this, And afterward... 
Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone, now this is, this is amazing, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved for on, for on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance as the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, this is significant because these demonic locusts are commanded not to do any damage to the earth, and they're forbidden to attack those that have the seal of God on their forehead. In other words, they're not allowed to touch the 144,000 witnesses or their converts. See, the truth is this. God knows how to protect and God knows how to deliver his people. And you've got to get this in your heart because religious teaching has given people a very twisted and sometimes distorted picture of who God is and what his nature is like. In Nahum chapter 1, the Bible tells us that God reserves wrath for his enemies, but for those who trust in him, that he's not only good, but that he's a stronghold in the day of trouble. And there's absolutely no doubt that at the sounding of the fifth trumpet judgment, that this is a time of great trouble. Now, but this promise also applies to your life right now, and it applies to your present troubles. And I don't know what you're going through or what you're facing or what's taking place in your life, but you have to remember this, that God is not only good, he's a stronghold of refuge, and he's a stronghold of protection no matter what you're going through. All right. Let's continue looking at our text in Revelation. Let's pick up again in Revelation 9, 4 and begin to read from there. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who have not the seal of God on their foreheads, and they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man, and in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Now, I can't even imagine the suffering that these people who are stung are going to experience over this five-month period of time. I mean, the passage is telling us that they're going to be in so much anguish that many of them are going to want to die. They're going to give up hope. They're going to actually long for death and that some of them are even going to try to commit suicide. But for whatever reason, it's going to be impossible to actually carry it out and actually do it. Now, you may have never thought about this, but since the original sin or the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, when death entered into the picture and became an absolute of human reality, this is the only time since Genesis chapter 3, that this consequence of man's sin is suspended to the degree that the suffering of being stung is going to drive people to kill themselves, but it's going to be impossible for them to actually accomplish it until this five-month period of time is over, which means that whatever they do to themselves is only going to make their suffering worse. Now, let me interject a side thought here because I think it's very important that we have a biblical perspective on why the tribulation and why these judgments are going to take place. According to Proverbs chapter 1, verse 30 and 31, the Bible says this, they would have none of my counsel and despised my every rebuke. Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their own way and be filled to the full with their own fancies. And as this fifth trumpet judgment sounds, 
God draws a line of separation around his people much in the same way that he did in the plagues of Egypt back in the book of Exodus. So he draws this line of separation around his people so that the only uh, people who are afflicted are unbelievers, many of whom who are worshiping the Antichrist. In other words, the 144,000 witnesses and their converts are spared from this demonic assault because they have the seal of God on their lives. And according to the book of Proverbs, judgment is the result of sin and rebellion towards God, and the tribulation is no different. It's a judgment against idolatry. It's a judgment against hard-heartedness. It's a judgment against those who've rejected and despised any form of correction from God that would lead them to repentance. See, when someone rejects the grace of God over and over and over again, they eventually arrive at the place where the only thing left is the fruit of their own rebellious choices. That's why the book of Hebrews admonishes us that when we hear God's voice, that we need to be people who respond immediately and that we're not to harden our hearts in rebellion or in stubbornness because this type of unbelief actually provokes and gives rise to the wrath of God, which then brings us into the tribulation, right? This is not only true now, but it's still true in the tribulation. Hard-heartedness and stubbornness and rebellion towards God are the very things that give rise to the wrath of God. Now, let's keep moving through our text. The Apostle John goes on to give an incredibly detailed description of these demon locusts. Revelation 9 Verse 7 through 10 says this. Now, listen listen to this because, I mean, this is something that comes straight out of the Bible, but it sounds like it's coming straight out of science fiction. It says this. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and their stings were in their tail, and their power was to hurt men five months." So as John sees this demonic horde of locusts begin to stream out from the bottomless pit, God gives him a closer look at these terrifying creatures. And even at this, the best description that John can give us is full of comparative references that describe their semblance, but also describe their supernatural strength and their speed, their intelligence, power, and even the malice that they have towards humanity. The truth is, we've never seen anything like them before on earth. They're strange demonic entities that are fallen angels or some sort of fallen angelic hybrid or possibly both. And I said this in my last video, but I think it's worth repeating. 2 Peter 2.4 says, God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and, de and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Now, I believe that the spirits who are imprisoned in the bottomless pit right now are the same demonic spirits that led to a near total defilement of humanity resulting in the flood of Noah. If you remember back in Genesis 6, there was an unbelievable amount of demonic corruption that spread across the earth. In fact, it started with a group of fallen angels who genetically corrupted both the human and animal, and animal gene pools. Even further, these fallen angels were so wicked that all but eight people on earth had lost the knowledge of righteousness 
and the rest of the population were evil in every intent and in every action before God. And I talked about this at length in my last video, uh, so if you missed it, I encourage you to go back and watch it because this is also a very interesting topic. But the issue that people have with teaching on this topic is that years of religious teaching and cultural bias, I believe, has led them to believe that while the devil and his demons are very real, that they're mostly relegated to more primitive parts of this world or scary stories or those unexplainable things that people film on their phones and then post on social media to freak people out. And I think that this is a perspective that a lot of people have on the demonic because it's a topic that makes them really uncomfortable. On top of that, it doesn't help that the special effects coming out of Hollywood have desensitized people to the idea of biblical judgment on this level because we see things like it at the movies all the time, right? But to our sophisticated Western mind, it doesn't seem to be rational to believe in spiritual doors and armies of demon locusts crawling out from hell once we leave the movie theater. Yet the Apostle Paul clearly tells us in Ephesians chapter 6 that the battle that we're fighting isn't a natural one and that it originates in the spirit realm and that our enemy rules through the darkness of this world and that he has set his entire demonic government against humanity. And that that's why we need to put on the armor of God. That's why we need to put on the armor of God so that we can stand against the enemy in those evil times. And I think sometimes people have over-spiritualized the armor of God and not recognized the righteousness before God, that the word of God, that the spirit of God, that all of these things are weapons given to us to be able to stand in our day of evil, to be able to stand against every onslaught and every attack of the enemy. In fact, even further, Jesus himself said that Satan only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Listen, you've got to get this in your spirit because there is a supernatural war that is taking place all around us, and that war began the moment that God created Adam and Eve. See, there's every indication that when Lucifer was still righteous before God, that he had uh, a form of authority over the earth, and that there were a considerable number of angels and potentially even a race of beings that were under his charge. And when Lucifer fell, many of them sided with him and took their stand against God. Now, check this passage out because it's incredibly interesting. As someone who believes the Bible, I recognize... Now, and don't hear me wrong. I believe the Word of God, and I believe the, cre the creation account in Genesis... And I recognize that our history begins in Genesis with Adam's creation. But you could surmise from the passage that I'm going to show you that there is a history of this planet that potentially predates our creation account in Genesis. Now, Ezekiel 28 makes you think, <coughs> excuse me, and... To be honest, it's one of those chapters in the Bible that leaves me with more questions than answers. But if you start reading in, in, in Ezekiel 28 and you pick it up in verse 12, the prophet shifts from talking about the earthly prince of Tyre and he turns his focus to describing Lucifer, who he allegorically refers to as the king of Tyre and the true power behind this prince's earthly throne. Now, look at this description because it begins with Lucifer's presence in Eden and then it moves progressively backward in time to something that existed before the Garden of Eden. It says this, You were the seal of perfection 
full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day that you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. Now that passage right there tells us we're not talking about a man, we're talking about an angelic presence. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were holy. You were on the holy mountain of God and you walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the days you were created. Now, see, here's the thing. Since Adam fell, no human has been perfect in his ways. So it says you were perfect in your ways from the days you were created till iniquity was found in you. Now look at this. This is where it gets really interesting. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out of the mountain of God and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Again, we are clearly not talking about a man. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground and I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. See, which makes you wonder if we go back before Eden, who did Lucifer trade with and who were the kings that saw him cast to the ground? Now, I don't know the answers to those questions. I, 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 don't, I don't know. In fact, like I said, that passage often leaves me with more questions than it does answers. What I do know is that when God created Adam and Eve, he gave them dominion over the earth. And since then, Satan has done everything possible to destroy mankind because he wants that authority and he hates everything that God loves. See, that's why the cross of Christ is the most significant thing that has ever taken place. Now, somebody's out there thinking, what does this have to do with Revelation? But you have to remember, the Bible tells us that the spirit of prophecy is Jesus Christ. See, it's about him, and Revelation is still about him, and the things that we're talking about is about the judgment that has to take place before Jesus can return and establish his kingdom on this earth for a thousand years. And the cross of Christ is the most significant thing that has ever taken place. In fact, it's the work on the cross that gave Jesus, the Lamb of God, the ability to open the seals and then begin to carry out even further judgment beyond that. See, Ephesians 1, verse 7 through 10 tells us that redemption through Christ was given to us because God is literally overflowing with grace towards us. And that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are in earth. In other words, the cross of Christ answered every issue that came about from Adam's sin, Lucifer's deception, and Lucifer's rebellion in both the natural and in the spirit realm. Now, let's finish our text for this session. Revelation 9.11 says this, And they, speaking of the locust, the locust horde that we've been talking about, And they had, as king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. I've said this before. But there are only four angels whose names are given to us in the Bible. Now, church tradition names quite a few others, but the Bible only names four. Michael, Gabriel, Lucifer, and Apollyon. Now, given the significance of the archangel Michael, Gabriel, and Lucifer, there's absolutely no doubt that Apollyon is equally significant 
And this and in this passage, he's referred to as the angel king of the abyss or the angel king of the bottomless pit. And even though we don't know a lot about Apollyon, it should be noted that John refers to him in Hebrew as Abaddon, which means destruction or ruin. But then he refers to him in the Greek as Apollyon, which means destroyer. And this is a reference to the Greek god Apollo, who among other things was the god of death and the god of pestilence. It's also interesting to note that in John's day, the cult of Apollo used the locust as their symbol, which according to their teachings and mythology was sacred to Apollo. And his locust apparently went everywhere that he did. Now the fifth trumpet judgment ends in Revelation 9 verse 12 by saying this, One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. The great takeaway is this. The tribulation is going to be an absolutely unprecedented time of judgment. And the judgment in the tribulation is progressively going to become worse. And you don't want to go through it. That's why it's important to respond to God's grace today. See, if you don't know the Lord today, the goodness and the mercy of God belongs to you if you want it. And there's never been a better time to humble yourself before God and just simply bow your heart and say, Lord, forgive me of my sins. Wash me in the precious blood of Jesus Christ and fill my life with your presence because I believe that Jesus is the Lord of all and I accept him as my Savior. It really is that easy. And if you just prayed that prayer, welcome to the family of God. Now, I'm going to stop there for today, but before you go, I want to pray a beautiful prayer from the Apostle Paul over your life. You can find this prayer in the book of Philippians chapter 1. Let's pray. In the words of the Apostle Paul, I pray this over your life. This is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and that you may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, being filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God bless. And I look forward to seeing you next time.